study of evolution, and it's a real honor and a real pleasure uh, this evening to introduce the current president uh, of the SSC, uh, Jared Coyne, uh, from the University of Chicago, who will be, uh, of course, delivering his presidential uh, address to us this evening. Um, I think it's fair to say that I uh, know Jerry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we did a little bit of work together uh, over the years. Uh, Jerry, by the way, told me that I should make this introduction funny. Um, and I, I, I actually I actually overruled him. I, I, I decided not to do that for two reasons. One, because if I start telling uh, funny stories about coin, we will have about five minutes left to speak uh, this evening. That didn't quite seem fair to him. Um, but the second reason, actually the more important reason, uh, is that I actually wanted to take the opportunity of introducing to make a simple uh, but serious point. Um, and, and the point is this, that uh, the study of speciation has become a pretty big deal uh, in the study uh, of evolutionary biology. Uh, I think you all know that. Uh, and the reason that speciation has become a, a big deal uh, has everything to do uh, with Jerry. Um, at this meeting, there are lots of sessions, there are lots of talks uh, about speciation, about reproductive isolation, of, uh, uh, of some past speciation, and so on. But in the mid-1980s, say, uh, at, 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 at such meetings, there were, there were very few uh, 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 talks or sessions devoted to speciation. There were, of course, some people, some evolutionary biologists, who were concerned uh, with speciation. But by and large, especially among evolutionary geneticists, population geneticists in particular, the field was pretty obsessed with the maintenance of genetic variation within species. And the problem of how species split genetically into two species was uh, largely, if not entirely, neglected. That changed uh, very dramatically uh, in the mid-1980s. And that change, I think, was largely due uh, uh, to Jerry's work. Uh, uh, on the genetics of speciation, it presents the hybrid sterility uh, in Versopla. In particular, his major paper on uh, the genetic basis of Haldane's rule, uh, without a doubt, triggered an, an avalanche uh, of new studies of speciation because it showed us, and this was really quite surprising and pretty dramatic, that we did not understand something very simple that the field had thought for decades that it did understand. So the simple point I want to make in this brief introduction, especially to those of you, which I think now is most of you, who are too young to appreciate how much the intellectual landscape shifted, is that many of you here are doing the research that you are doing because Jerry did the research that he did. I really don't think that's an exaggeration, and I think um, is probably one of the uh, most important things one can say about a scientist, that not only did they do, and not only do they do superb science, but that it was science that changed the direction of the field and really mattered to large numbers of people. Perhaps even more impressive than that, uh, Jerry has stayed at the forefront of speciation studies uh, for several decades now. And in fact, uh, I believe it's going to be that uh, more recent work uh, that Jerry's been doing on the genetic speciation uh, that he will uh, speak to us about uh, this evening. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Jerry, uh, who is going to speak to us uh, this evening. Uh, the title is not up there, but he'll be speaking to us this evening about uh, two flies on an island, uh, a case study of speciation.
address the National Academy of Sciences. But, uh, that's only for the select few of us. Um, so as Alan said, most of the work in my laboratory, in fact, almost all of it since I was a postdoc, has been on speciation, and in particular, the thrust of the lab over the last decade, I guess over the last 30 years, really, has been trying to understand something about the process of speciation by analyzing the genetic patterns that it leaves behind. So we look at the genetics of reproductive barriers and morphological differences between species, and from that, I can see the slides kind of cut off. Try to infer something about how speciation works. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. When I was going to give this talk, I'll go back, um, there's two routes that you can take of giving a presidential address. And Alan mentioned both of these in Portland last year. You can actually talk about research, which in my case would be number three, talking about your students' research, or you can try to summarize the state of the field, i.e. pontificate at great length. And I didn't know what to do, so I canvassed all of my most trustworthy colleagues. And to a person, their advice was, give a research talk. I don't know whether that reflects their own interests or something about my inability to pontificate, but that's what I'm <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the last, say, five or six years of work that I've done along with my lab on um, two species of flies found in a simp island and what it says something, what it says or could say about speciation, certainly in this system and perhaps more broadly across other species of flies and animals. It's a common upon me when I'm talking about speciation. You get my definition at the very beginning of what species are, what speciation is. So this is it. This is the correct definition of species. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that doesn't have the definition can leave. I'm going to lose all the systemists. I'm going to lose all the, um, the groups of reproductive uh, organisms that are separated from other organisms by these reproductive barriers. So the process of speciation, as it was. Um, envisioned by many of the modern scientists, founders, including Ernst Meyer, is the erection of these reproductive barriers that impede gene flow between these species. So, what we want to do is study the erection of these reproductive barriers between species by looking at the genetic basis of those barriers. Okay. Now, when you want to choose species, and I'm limited to Drosophila because that's basically all I know, for work on the genetics of speciation, there's basically three criteria that you have to meet. First of all, the species that you're working on have to be recently diverged, ideally sister species, because you want to look at speciation either when it's close to being finished or in a statute and said die, not after it's been over for a million years when post-speciation events have happened. Second of all, you want the species to be crossable. In my world, maybe not in yours if you're younger, genetics means making a cross. And so if you're doing genetic analysis between species, you want them to be able to cross. And that means produce fertile hybrids so you can do that cross as well. And finally, if you're interested in ecology, which I am, although it's difficult to do it yourself, but you want these species to live in the same place. So ideally, you can actually investigate the reproductive barriers and keep them apart where they actually live in nature, rather than if they're living in different places and you're just testing them in the small glass tubes in the laboratory. So these are the three requirements. So you think that they would be easy to meet in the genus Drosophila because it's so well studied, but actually they're not. Um, this is probably, or arguably, the most well-studied group of organisms genetically in the world, which is the Drosophila melanogaster subgroup, consisted until about 2,000 of these eight species, and we know a hell of a lot about the genetics. This is the true phylogeny of the group, which comes together from many different areas, including chromosome banding, and yet none of these species, these eight that were known until 2000, satisfy those three criteria. They could produce fertile hybrids, but they didn't live in the same place. Or they weren't sister species, but none of them were species that lived in the same place, they were very closely related, and could produce hybrids. Okay. And this is the eighth. That changed in 2000 when my colleague Daniel Lachette and a few of his French colleagues discovered this new species, Drosophila santomea, bringing the total to nine. These species with the eyes by them mean that they live on islands, so they're island endemics. And now we have this pair, Drosophila yucuba and Drosophila santomea, which are sister species. They're very closely related, and much of the data all comes to show us that they're about 400,000 years old, which is fairly young. And they live in the same place, at least in one area, which is the island of Sao Tome, off the west coast of Africa. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is basically talk about the genetic studies that we've done with this pair of species, satisfying all the criteria I've laid out, and compare them to other species in the group, maybe come to some general conclusions. Okay. So first of all, where do they live? 
Chrysophila acuba, which is one of the sister pair, is widely found in sub-Saharan Africa. It's the denizen of open habitat. It lives in grassland and savannas and in open forests. And it's also found in this island of Sao Tome, which is about 300 kilometers off the west coast of Africa, off of Gabon. Okay. On that island as well lives the sister species, the island endemic, um, Chrysophila San Tome, which is found only on the island. So we have a mainland, maybe an ancestral lineage that somehow produced a species that is an island. Here's Sao Tome. It's part of a chain of volcanic islands, which I like to think of as the Galapagos off of Africa, um, in the Gulf of Guinea. So there's a little chain that runs down from that horn of Africa into the um, uh, Atlantic Ocean. This is one of them, uh, Sao Tome. It's part of the Republic of Sao Tome. It's a country consisting of two islands. The species for Sao Tome is found only on this island. As I said, I like to think of them as the Galapagos of Africa for several reasons. It's a group of volcanic islands which contains a number of endemic species of interest, plants and animals. And it straddles the equator, just like the Galapagos is. There's the equator it's just a few miles off the southern tip of San Tome. The island is a relatively small one. It's about 30 by 50 kilometers. It's a 1,001 square kilometers exactly. And the age of the island is about 12 million years, but it might have been below sea level part of that time. It is volcanic, like the Galapagos. It, it is an oceanic island. On this island, both of these sister species live. This is their altitudinal distribution because they are ecologically separated, starting at sea level, running up to, um, well, in this case, 1,700 meters. The height of the island is actually 2,024 meters. And you can see at low elevations, almost all of the species that you find is the mainland African species. These are cut air, over areas, plantations, um, rural areas, etc. And then as you get higher and higher in the river, the rainforest begins, there's the entrance to the National Park in San Tome, which pretty much corresponds to virgin rainforest, which is uncut. There's a transition from the mainland species to the island. Okay. There's also a hybrid zone, somewhere between 1,100 and 1,400 meters, right there, where the frequency of hybrids. So these things do live together in nature, they're altitude and they're segregated, but they do have overlapping ranges and they do hybridize in the area of overlap. The number of hybrid areas where it could be anywhere between 1 and 5 percent, depending on when you collect them. So that's where they are and how they're distributed. How do the species form in the first place? Well, there's two alternatives, as you, and you all know this well if you study speciation. The sympathetic scenario, which would invoke the invasion of the island by a mainland lineage from, related to Drosophila Cuba. And then the in situ speciation on that island into Yakuba living on the island and Santa Maria, the endemic living on the island. So, this is a split on that small area of land corresponding to synthetic speciation. Um, if that were the case, and you made the phylogeny of these species, you would find that the two, the two populations on the island, Yakuba and Santa Maria, would be each other's closest relatives, whereas the outgroup would be the mainland on the ancient Drosophila Yakuba. And that's exactly what you find, in fact, if you look at mitochondrial DNA. This is, for, well, I'm sorry, this is cut off, but that's mitochondrial DNA. This is exactly the lineage you find. So if you look at the mitochondrial DNA of these species, and you can sequence the whole damn thing, the conclusions are the same, sympathetic species. Okay. The alternative is an alternative made famous by Ernest Meyer, the double colonization scenario, where the South Lake Cuba and the lineage invaded the island, say, 400,000 years ago. It became a new species by itself after invading the island, like things happened in the Galapagos. And then, sometime more recently, say in the last five or 600 years, perhaps, Drosophila Cuba invaded again from the mainland, and that accounts for the presence of both species on the island. So it's not an insight species speciation event, it's a double colonization. And if that were the case, then if you did the phylogeny, you would see that Drosophila Cuba from the mainland and the island are each other's closest relatives, the Santa Maria being the outer. And this is what you see if you look at two other types of Sorry, you can't see it. Y chromosomal and mitochondrial DNA, sorry, Y chromosomal and nuclear DNA all conspire to give you this phylogeny. So we have two different phylogenies depending on what kind of DNA you use, two different scenarios of speciation. This, in fact, is the right one. Um, the correct one is the double colonization hypothesis. I'll show you why later. The big lesson of this is do not ever use mitochondrial DNA. <laughs> 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 Okay, so uh, before I go into the science, I want to get a little travel log about Santa Fe, what it's like to work there. I'm not a field biologist, I was unwillingly forced 
to do this.